Uh, most of my talks, if you've heard me talk before, I've always talked about these huge, large vacuum furnaces uh, that's in our facility in Western PA. Uh, today my talk is about a relatively small vacuum furnace, small for us, uh, an HL50 size furnace, 36 by 36 by 48 deep, but with some very unique and extreme cooling rates. The objective of this uh, paper is to put a little science behind this technology of high pressure gas quenching and to study hardenability. And to study hardenability, everybody goes, turns to the Jomini end test, test, quench test. Um, my goal here is uh, to look at typically oil and water quenched alloys and to, to high pressure gas quench these in a Jomini situation. Of course, the ultimate goal is, all of our customers want, is heat treating near net shape parts. So vacuum gas quenching, historically, has always been the preferred process when heating tool steels, hot and cold, working tool steels, and stainless steels. High pressure gas quenching, however, has increasingly being used for alloy steels and case hardening steels today. So why is gas quenching preferred? Uh, you might go through all the reasons that you see everywhere in the literature, but the main goal, the main reason you want a high pressure gas quench is to reduce distortion. And we do that basically because we're cooling simply by conduction. Whereas liquid quenching, you have the vapor phase, the vapor transport phase, and then the conductive phase, and the cooling curve is very erratic, where with gas quenching, it's all one phase conduction. I can honestly say in the first two-thirds of my life, I cracked a lot of parts. Uh, in this last portion of my life, with working with vacuum furnaces and seeing some of the quench rates we can attain, I have never cracked a part. So, Therefore, you, you reduce your distortion, of course, uh, the risk of cracking. The other advantages are it's an environmentally friendly process. Uh, this test is basically using nitrogen. Uh, very, you know, it's in the air we breathe. It's 80% of the air we're breathing in this room right now, so it's very environmentally friendly. Uh, we have loved in the past the use of helium, but if you read one of my most recent papers about the shortage of helium in the world, uh, or if you Google helium, you'll know that uh, helium is not going to be a player in the future, I believe. Um, it's becoming increasingly expensive, increasingly rare, and um, it's, it's really a problem uh, to attain. We are able to attain it through contracts, but uh, we are curtailed on our usage. So we're looking at, looking at higher gas velocities and higher pressures using the very inexpensive gas of nitrogen. Part surfaces are free from oxides and quench media, which eliminates many downstream processes. And you, know, you might say, well, people might not want to uh, pay the extra for high pressure gas quenching versus oil quenching. Well, when you look at some of the downstream processes, when you get bright clean parts out, uh, if the part needs to be plated uh, downstream, there's a lot of operations that can be cut out and less machining too. Quench rates are adjustable by varying gas pressure and or gas velocity. And most importantly, we can direct thermocouple these parts during the quenching for repeated and consistent results in production. One of the companies that first acknowledges, acknowledged high pressure gas quenching has been Boeing Aircraft. Uh, Boeing has a specification um, written where you have to maintain a certain cooling rate at a certain bar, minimal bar pressure, and they give you uh, tolerances that you must cool the part to and that's the first time we actually put some science to quenching with actual cooling rates, not just simply saying water 
or oil, as we all know, there's different speeds of water. There's different speeds of water, of oil. So we actually have a direct correlation to temperature and pressures. So Boeing has taken the lead in that, I believe in BAC 5617 spec on, on alloy, oil hardening alloys, alloys such as 4340M um, and other alloys. So that's some of the advantage. My um, objective in, this exper in these experiments is to critically evaluate the hardenability of certain alloys using the standardized Jomini water end quench test, what we all know in this room, the standard test, versus a non-traditional Jomini air end quench test. My first phase of the test, uh, the tests were performed in a controlled laboratory setting uh, in our plant in Western PA. Uh, we set up a bench uh, for different types of jom the, the two different types of Jomini tests. Phase two, uh, the tests were performed in a specifically designed vacuum chamber. And our final stage, uh, phase three, we simulated large production cooling tests in our newly designed solar super quench vacuum furnace. So looking at our first phase, um, we cho I chose, decided to choose three alloys that we see every day. Um, two of which that we're, we're doing every day at 10 bar pressure, uh, the 4140 per ASTMA 108 and 4340 per ASTMA 322. But one alloy I haven't been very successful with is 4130, which is, you all know, it's a water hardening alloy steel. Um, all Jomini bars uh, were pre-normalized at 1700 degrees, and the austenitizing temperatures of those respective alloys were as follows. In the laboratory setting in, in Hermitage uh, in Western PA, we transferred the Jomini bars quickly um, from the air furnace to a separate fixture for, uh, for, for the air. And of course, the water quench, I had, that being, I had that done at an independent laboratory, laboratory testing in Hatfield, PA. They did all the Jomini tests on the exact same heats that I did my air quenching test. So the chemistries matched exactly for each different alloy. Jomini fixtures were identical, including the half inch distance from the end of the bar, uh, of the Jomini bar, and of course the half inch ID orifice for the cooling media. Both water and gas media remain at a constant 70 degrees Fahrenheit per ASTM A255. This is just a picture of the two stands. Um, the left picture showing the water Jomini test performed at LTI. And the right picture, picture there is the air Jomini fixture that we built in Hermitage, Pennsylvania. You can see the, uh, the gas line coming up hooked to our nitrogen line at the bottom. So I needed a rationale on what type of uh, gas velocities would we be looking at. You know, over the years, uh, we had a vacuum, we have an old vacuum furnace that could barely blow a candle out. Uh, so, and then we have these new super quenching furnaces. So I basically took it down to three vacuum furnaces um, over the last, basically over the last three decades. And they were all identical size furnaces. The work zone sizes were, were 36 by 36 by 48, a typical HL50 size vacuum furnace with a 3,500 pound load capacity, graphite hot zone construction, and a maximum operating temperature of 2650F. This is uh, an anemometer we bought to check the velocities of these three furnaces. We vary that anemometer around the furnace, getting averages of, of gas speeds. Um, we, did it, we did our test first with the door open, then we closed the door, and uh, Bob Sandora, who's in attendance here, figured a way through the, uh, through the lines, through the, uh, through the ports of getting this, this anemometer set up with the door closed and up to pressure. 
This this furnace, by the way, was that 10 bar is a 10 bar furnace. So we basically look at measure the velocities of a furnace built circa 1990. This was this furnace was located back in Southern Pennsylvania, and we measured that speed at about 50 miles per hour, and it had a 100 horsepower blower motor on it. The next furnace we looked at was our 10 bar furnace in Hermitage, PA. Um, and that was built around two, year 2000. And that furnace has a 200, um, has 100, uh, we measured 100 miles per hour with a 200 horsepower blower motor. And then finally here, this picture is our new, brand new solar super quench furnace. It was built in 2012. Uh, we just installed the furnace. So you're seeing new data that's, that's within the month, uh, a month old. And uh, we're getting some tremendous, tremendous gas velocities out of this furnace, 200 mile an hour with a 300 uh, horsepower blower motor. Now, the, the, the real key to this furnace is um, it's a revolutionary design in the recirc recirculation of the gas. It has less pressure drops throughout the cooling system with increased pressure drops directed right on the nozzles, which equates to increased gas velocity. So all the work of that motor is being directed towards those nozzles. There will be a later talk, uh, I believe tomorrow, by Nick Cordisco describing this furnace in more detail. So, just some graphs to show um, some of our results. You know the rationale for my for the uh, gas velocities we ch we ch we tested, and here you can see the typical water Jomini end quench test. You can see this in any ASM book you ever want to look at. But I just wanted to make sure we're duplicating the the same data with the same chemistry and material. So I de I developed my own curve for the water end quench test. And you can see my 200 mile an hour test here with the solid blue line. Uh, the purple line was 100 mile an hour and the 50 mile an hour gas. And that's for 4130 at atmospheric pressure in my test stand. <clears throat> for 4140, you can see a very nice correlation with the 200 mile an hour gas with the water, Jomini and quench whereas the 100-mile-an-hour and the 50-mile-an-hour gas did not fare so well. 4340, much more hardenable alloy steel. Not surprisingly, it's very grouped together. This curve doesn't show you much, but expanding that, that scale here, you know, going from 50 Rockwell to 60 Rockwell now, you, know, you can see out at the end we were matching the uh, hardness of water of the water Jomini test. And we had some little crazy results here, I gotta believe from the conduction of the gas. Um, they kinda shot up here versus the water quench. But you can see the 100 mile an hour and the 50 mile an hour, uh, you get much letter, less as quenched hardness on the end of that Jomini bar. Phase two of uh, our experiment um, actually, this furnace was built by solar manufacturing and solar atmospheres together. Uh, this is a little test stand. Uh, the furnace is probably about 8 inch diameter, 12 inches high. And we built it specifically to hold a Jomini stand, a Jomini fixture within there. Uh, we made some adaptions to this furnace. Um, one thing we have added that I did not do on my um, <clears throat> my my experiment on the plant floor, we drilled this Jomini bar. We now have a thermocouple drilled down to within one half inch from the end and one inch from the end. So now we're able to see cool, actual cooling rates of that Jomini bar as we're adding gas velocity and adding pressure. Um, this is a picture of the actual furnace. We actually had an, uh, a college intern this summer uh, we, with our help, and he designed it and basically built it. And he went back to college, and now we're finishing it off. But uh, we found 
we, we have done a few experiments so far in it, and I was hoping to have better information for you today. But we found out we had a, rest, um, a little bit of a gas restriction. Here you see the nozzle coming up through um, the, the metal hot zone of the furnace, and we had that, we had that spring-loaded device on the top and we really felt like we had too much gas restriction there. We have changed that design to a valve off design and we're adjusting pressure with that valve coming through. Let the gas come out and through that chamber. So just as of Saturday, we got our first actual good result. We took it up to four bar pressure and uh, we're matching our, my atmospheric results um, on that furnace. So, but that was just for 4340. My real key interest is how this will perform at 10 bar. We only built this to 10 bar pressure using uh, 4130. That's, my, that's what I want to see. Increasing the pressure still with the 200 mile an hour gas velocity. That's a top view of the hot zone. Uh, just underneath, you can see it's on a basic workbench. Um, the transformer, little vacuum pump here. So it's, it's, it's a permanent test stand that we're going to be looking at a lot of different alloys in this in the future. So the phase three of my test was actually taking this to a, stepping it up to a production stage. And so we took 20 steel bars, three inch diameter by 24 inches long, four baskets, <clears throat> one grid, a total weight of 1,300 pounds. And the real key, we have seven TCs deeply embedded four inches down into, that, into those bars throughout the load. The, the thermocouples were identical for all tests. And here's some of the uh, results that we received from the solar super quench furnace. You can see at two bar pressure, the cooling rates all the way up to 20 bar. I took that same load and ran it in our furnace number two, if you remember, that 10 bar furnace. And these were the cooling rates, two, four, six, and 10 bar with the dotted lines. Of course, I'm not including the furnace th temperature. The furnace TCs came down on a straight line. That will just confuse the issue. But when you overlay them, you can see some very interesting results. Again, the dotted lines are the, is the older technology, circuit year, year 2000, and the solid lines is the new solar super quench furnace. Most impressive here that I think, you can see right here, if you look at this aqua line here, that is a four bar quench on a new furnace and equates to our 10 bar quench on the older ferns. Big improvement in cooling. Now, I want to increase that load size. I want to do more tests on this. But as I said, this furnace is just underway in testing. And hopefully next week, it will be in production. So my conclusions, um, at atmospheric pressure, gas velocities up to 200 miles per hour must be attained to duplicate traditional Jomini and quench tests quench results for 4140 and 4340 steels. At atmospheric pressures, gas velocities of up to 200 miles per hour are not sufficient to duplicate Jomini and quench tests for 4130 material. But increased pressure results are pending. Jomini and quench test hardenability data for gas pressures up to 10 bar for the same alloy is pending. The solar super quench vacuum furnace has the capability to fully harden 4140 and 4340 material. Solar super quench vacuum furnace will demonstrate a 48% improved cooling rate time when compared to older designs. Uh, some of my future work, I, I you know, over the years, I've had many people have a lot of distortion problems. Um, many people ask if I could ever do 1090 or 1075 spring steel. They wanted to keep springs, keep
keep the shape of the spring. So I would love to play around a little bit with 1095, 1075 material carbon steel. 52100, we all know in the world there's a crying need to keep distortion to a minimum on bearings. I would love to look at um, 52100. In fact, I have material ordered and we'll be going through the same protocol here with 52100. And as you know, many people get into low pressure gas uh, carburizing and um, 8620 to get good core hardnesses on larger size loads are sometimes difficult to attain. So I want to employ the same technique with 8620. Of course, we know 9310, the higher alloys of carburizing grades are no problem with high pressure gas quenching, but the workhorse is 8620. Finally, I'd like to try a little bit something with uh, my business in Western PA. We're about 60% aerospace, and I know the advantage we can get by high pressure gas quenching titanium 6AL4V. Um, we have done some medical uh, parts with using 10 bar pressure, using helium, of course, you can't use nitrogen with titanium because uh, it would form a very detrimental layer. But we, we have been able to meet uh, the speeds of water using helium with thin cross sections. I want to look at this. Now, it's going to be a lot different. It won't be an end quench hardenability study. It'll be looking more at structure or strength as we go back on the bar. But I want to try to equate something to uh, some titanium, uh, especially, again, the workhorse in the titanium world, 6AL4V. There are many other alloys we can look at. If you have any ideas, you have any uh, ideas, please see me. Here's my email address. I gave everybody a copy of, of, the, of my uh, paper today. You can contact me by email. Um, I'm also citing a paper that after I did this, I, I was aware that um, this was done back in 2009 by a professor in Croatia, um, Dr. Landek, who performed similar type of work. He built a small chamber, small vacuum chamber with some inductor coils but he performed his work only with O2 tool steel. Now, we've been doing O2 for, O2 for quite a while now. So this is taking it another step with pressures and gas velocity. But I, I just wanted to cite this paper, and, and some of this work has been done previously. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much.